And so today, my talk is going to be about responsive web. And a few months ago, my company decided to undergo a visual brand redesign where they get to unify the design language of the site. But at the same time, they wanted to make the site responsive. So during the responsive web project, I noticed that we did a lot of mistakes that we could have avoided if we had known of the common problems in responsive web development earlier. So this is what my talk is going to be about today. It's going to be about the responsive web mistakes that we did, how we solve it, and what you can do to avoid it. So a little bit about me. I'm Aisha Angraini. I go by Ren Aisha on the internet. I work as a front-end engineer at Viki. Viki is a global TV site powered by fans, where fans get to form communities to subtitle the shows on the site. Responsive web development workflow is very different from a non-responsive one, and I learned this the hard way. So this is because in responsive web a non-responsive website, you have a site that is supposed to work on several browsers, and it should only work on desktop. But on responsive site, you have several different screen sizes and different devices that you need to take into account of. And during my time working on the project, I noticed that there are three common problems that keep on recurring. And this problem always centers on how designers and developers work together, how to ensure that you're writing maintainable code, and coming up with testing and debugging strategy. More often than not, I think responsive web development will force you to change your design, development, and testing workflow. And I find that changing this workflow is especially challenging, especially when you're working on revamping a non-responsive site to a responsive one. Because chances are you and your team members are already used to working on the non-responsive web development workflow, which brings me to my very first blooper of the day. Initially, during our responsive web project, we had a lack of collaboration between designers and developers. There's a lot of back and forth style of communication between us. And initially, this communication works fine for us during our pre-responsive era. But during the project itself, it becomes a major problem. And as you know, old habits die hard. Without actually noticing it, we adopt the same communication style during our responsive web project. And it turns out to be a problem for us. So what do I mean by a back and forth style of communication? So you have a designer. And designer will pass a high fidelity design mockup to developer. And during the development stage, this is when the developers start to find problems with the design. And when problems are found, design gets passed back to the designer. This is when the designer starts to get stressed out and start thinking about all of the possible solutions that they can use in order to solve the problem. And once the solution is found, the design mockup gets updated and gets passed back to the developer. But it's not the end of the story, because problems will keep on being found. And the cycle will just keep on repeating itself. So I have three reasons why this type of communication actually failed during responsive web development. And the first thing is limitation. See, designers are creative beings. I wish I can be half as creative as them, but most of the time, I only like to pretend to be a designer on a daily basis. And so whenever I look at my designers working, it impresses me because there's no limitation to their creativity. But there's always going to be limitation when you start developing their ideas. For example, a designer may come to you with fancy animations. And there's always going to be limitations on how this animation would render on smaller screen devices to, and, and also in older browsers. Designers will come to you with big images to be implemented on the site. But there's always going to be limitations on how these images would affect the performance of your site and also the art direction on your smaller skin devices of your site. And designers may also come with beautiful and intricate layouts. But there's always going to be limitation in terms of the difference in expectation 
on how this layout is supposed to render on smaller screen to larger screen devices. For example, my designer came up to me one day and showed me this mock-up. This is the blueprint of the mock-up and how it should render on large screen device. As you can see, the episodes, clips, and trailers should appear as a sidebar. So at a glance, I understand that on smaller screen device, the sidebar should appear right under the main content area. And in this case, the episodes, clips, and trailers should appear under collections. But my designer has a totally different expectation. So he expects the episodes to appear right below the About section, while the clips and trailers should appear right below collections. So this is an example of the difference of expectations that you may encounter when you're working on such a project and when you're working closely with the designer. This is the kind of expectations that you should communicate verbally to each other and that you should not rely on mockups alone to pass the message effectively, which brings me to my second reason on why such a communication style failed, the mockups itself. Mockups don't really tell you much about what the performance of your site is going to be like. It doesn't tell you much about the development complexity that you may run into when you start developing the site. And most importantly, it doesn't really tell you about the interaction type that's going to be on your site. So there's a, this amazing quote by Tom Maslan. Tom Maslan is actually a developer working on responsive web development at BBC. I got this quote from a book called Real Life Responsive Web Design by Smashing Magazine that was out earlier this year. I suggest everyone who's working on responsive website to read the book. I wish I stumbled upon it earlier. So basically, Tom's quote summarizes that you can't really assume that small screen devices interaction is going to be done by touch, while a large screen one will be done by mouse. And you would understand where Tom is coming from if you actually take an iPad, visit a site on iPad, and switch it to landscape mode. It most of the time will take the desktop set of the design, and depending on your design, where your interaction type works seamlessly on desktop, it will start to fail on the iPad landscape mode. So this is the kind of design problems that you may encounter. This is the kind of limitations that you may encounter. And the third reason is shortcomings. Design shortcomings will be discovered really late. And in our case, it's always discovered during the development stage. And this is when you will start thinking about employing different kinds of hacks, shortcuts, and libraries. And I don't think that it's going to be healthy for your code climate if you make it a habit. And also, if there's any last minute feature that you forgot to include, it will actually, you won't be able to squeeze it in. For example, at Viki, we have very passionate users. We have uh, users working as volunteers to actually provide subtitles on the site on a daily basis. And we actually value the opinions of these users because we want to make their job easier for them, but at the same time, we want the site to be fun for them to use. So when we roll out the responsive web, they were complaining about a feature that we missed out, which is the cinematic mode feature. So just to walk you through our previous workflow, we have a high fidelity design mockup that we test and validate. Once we go to the development stage, this is where we lost a lot of time due to the back and forth style of communicating with each other. Once we start to roll it out for beta testing and ask users about their opinions on the site, this is when they start suggesting feature requests that we have no time for. So after applying some fin finishing touch, we decided to roll the site out. But this, there was a lot of backlash from the users because we actually did not include the cinematic mode feature that they liked so much. So initially, pre-responsive era, we had the cinematic mode as a default. But when we actually wrote the responsive site, we no longer have the cinematic mode. This is when we have a lot of criticism from our users, like the site started to look very much like a hospital. It looks too wide, too bright. It's really hard for me to actually watch my shows. All of these kinds of first world problems. But <laughs> so this is, but, when, but we understand, after interviewing the users, we actually understand 
where they are coming from because they don't actually view this the video on full view mode. And the reason is because they like to multitask and viewing videos on full view mode does not allow them to do that. I know that this problem, this communication style is just going to be more of a problem for us in the long run. So I suggested a different way of working to my designers one day. And after a bit of banter, they finally agree with it. And um, it's more of a collaborative style of working. So what does a collaborative workflow looks like right now at Viki? So we have a designer who passed in a low fidelity mockup or sketches to the developer. And this is where the developer would start prototyping the mockup. This is where the developer would start assessing the problems, the potential problems that could happen with the design. And from these, um, from these problems discovered, the developer would start giving feedback to the designer on what works and what doesn't. And based on this information, the designer would then start designing based on constraints. They would start developing a high fidelity mockup based on the constraints set by the developer. And we find that this is a very effective way of working together because the developer is highly involved in the design. And ultimately, your design is decided in the browser and not through Photoshop. And the only way to access your design more effectively is through browsers because only browsers can tell you what kind of interaction types works for you. And if you only solely design in Photoshop, most of the time, you're making a lot of assumption. And then that assumption may or may not be true. And most of the time, you'll make a lot of mistakes through that assumption. When I first suggested this style of working, there's a lot of doubts coming from my team members because they feel that prototyping will take a lot of time. So if you have the same concern, I would say that there's nothing to worry about because it's not necessary to prototype everything. For me, what I like to prototype is I just like to get the layout work, just understanding how the layout would behave on smaller screen device to a large screen one. And also, <clears throat> I also like to test the interaction types, seeing how it works on smaller screen devices as well. And the rule of prototyping is, I read somewhere that the rule of prototyping should be less than an hour to build. And you shouldn't care much about aesthetic. The rule is to just build fast and build ugly. And also, if you have a pattern library, which we have at Viki, it'll make prototyping that much faster. <clears throat> so just to walk you through our new workflow, we have a design mock. But prior to that, we have been prototyping, and we have accessed the feasibility of the design. And then we start testing it. Once we get to development stage, we notice that there's a less time lost here compared to before, because we finally know if there's a problem, we know about it beforehand. We're not surprised by it anymore, and we definitely know how to solve it this time. And once we roll it out for better testing, if there's any feature requests that we can still squeeze in, we will do it before rolling it out. So I talk a lot about losing time. And as developers, I think that one of our concern when we're working on big projects is deadline. And I think deadline could be, worrying about deadline could be a bad thing because you'll get really excited to just start developing right away. And that could be a bad thing because that means that there's a lack of planning on development. And when there's a lack of planning on development, it would actually be dangerous because you will notice that your technical depth will start to increase. And when your technical depth increases, you need to actually allocate time in the future to start refactoring your code. And when you're working on a product-centric company like Viki, we have product development on a quarterly basis um, when we need to allocate time for refactoring and also allocating time for product development, it can get pretty overwhelming. So I was reviewing my CSS code one day. There were two other guys writing the CSS code with me. And I noticed that there's a lot of inconsistency. There's an inconsistent ways of writing media queries. One file, the media queries is written in a nested manner, while the other one is unnested. 
And there's also an inconsistent paradigm in writing CSS. On one file, it is written in a mobile-first manner, and another file, it's written in a desktop-first manner, which is very inconsistent. And the first thing that I wish I had done is to actually come up with a coding style guide before starting development, just thinking about naming conventions and how you're going to organize your files, and also think about the many the nesting levels. Sometimes I notice that some developers can get very carried away in nesting their SaaS. They could go to five to six levels, and that's not going to be very performant for your code. And also think about how you're going to write your media queries. Set the kind of standards on how you should write it in order to maintain consistency, because consistency is the key to maintainability. I want to talk a little bit about naming conventions. I think there's a lot of paradigm out there. And it could be overwhelming to pick which one that you're going to use. For example, the top three that I've learned about is BAM, OOCSS, and SMACS. But ultimately, it doesn't really matter which naming conventions you're going to use. But your team members do, do care about it. And my advice is to actually sit down with your team members, decide on which naming conventions that you want to use, and actually stick with it. The sticking with it is important, because don't make it up as you go along the way, because it's just going to increase your technical depth. I have some resources that I want to share with you, because coming up with a coding style guide initially can get pretty overwhelming. You may not know where to start. The first one is CSS Guidelines by Harry Roberts. I think there's some really amazing recommendations here. There's also, if you're writing SAS, there's also a SAS style guide written by Chris Coyer. I think also, again, amazing recommendations. But my personal favorite is SAS guidelines by Hugo Garaudel. I like this the most because he actually includes further readings that you can learn more about why he recommends certain things in a specific manner. <clears throat> so another thing that you need to think about is, See, you have deadlines, and it's very, very tempting to just jump into development straight away. And one of them is to actually quickly just use frameworks. But the thing about frameworks is that sometimes it has more than what you actually need, which just contributes more to CSS bloat. It will just bloat the CSS file. And also, I found that certain frameworks could be very opinionated, and it's very rigid to actually overwrite their classes. And therefore, it's not that straightforward. Also, I noticed that it is important to pre pick the right framework, because an unsuitable framework can be more harmful than no frameworks at all. This is because with unsuitable frameworks, you're going to spend a lot of time just taking those code out and rewriting everything at the end of the day. But this is not to say that I am against framework 100%. I think that. There are justified reasons for you to use CSS frameworks. I just think that it is important to pick the right one. There's a different school of thoughts to this. For example, for some people, Bootstrap may not be a good framework, but for some other people, it's a good one. So I think that ultimately, you should go with a battle-tested framework that is well-known, like Bootstrap or Foundation. And if you decide not to use frameworks at all, you can always learn from it. Use it as a guideline. So that's my suggestion for you. And of course, when you start working on responsive web development, you will run into different kinds of issues like browsers and device issues. So the best way to deal with this early is to decide on a target browsers and device. And there are several reasons to this. The first one is because you want to know what the problem is with the device itself. For example, if you decided to support Android 2.3, I heard a lot of horror stories about it. So you, you can know about the problems beforehand, and you can let your designers know about it so that they can also design within that constraint. And also, it is useful so that you can research the issues beforehand. There's an amazing GitHub repo called Device Box created by Scott Jail. I think it's amazing because he actually described some of those issues in a very specific manner. And also, he actually lists how you can reproduce this, those issues and also 
there's also suggestions on workaround on how to bypass those issues. Now, of course, when it comes to device bugs, I think the best way to actually deal with it is to start testing on device early, which brings me to my third and very last blooper of the day. We start testing late on device, and relying, we rely too much on emulators. And the reason for that is we are too used to our non-responsive web development workflow. We never actually need to test on device before. So we didn't have the habit of testing uh, with devices before. But I think it's really important to just start device testing early because you want to test those interactions. Is the scrolling working as expected on mobile devices? Is touch working as expected? Does the drop-down disappear when you click outside of the drop-down? Things like that. And also, certain bugs and quirks only happen on mobile and sometimes specific device. I have this really weird bug that happened only on Sony Xperia. I can't really remember the version, but when a user actually visited a video page and started viewing the video in full view mode, and once they actually copped out and go back to the normal mode, the site actually zoom in into the nav bar, but we actually noticed this kind of late because we didn't get into the habit of testing on devices early. So I think it's important to think about your workflow. I think it is important to include testing on devices as frequently as possible. So this is how my previous workflow looked like. I will build all of the UI components in a particular page, then I'll deploy to staging, and then I start to test it. But this is, at the end of the development, this is where I find a lot of trivial bugs on mobile, which I could have fixed earlier if I knew about it earlier. So I kind of changed the workflow to be better in a sense that I will just build a UI component, and I will connect my local dev environment to my mobile phone. There's a lot of way to do that via IP address. And this is where I find a lot of trivial bugs where I can then fix it immediately, right? So repeating it off after developing all of the other UI elements, once I actually deploy it to staging and start testing it, I notice that there are no longer too much uh, trivial bugs. I can focus on the major ones. And so I know that sometimes we have non-trivial backend. For some of you, you guys may use, you guys may work with third-party web services. Then connecting to mobile may not be as easy. There's two tools that I would like to introduce to you guys. One is local tunnel, another one is proxy local. It actually creates a proxy of your local environment and makes it available on the internet. My, and you can actually assess your access your mo, your site through local tunnel on other devices. My only complaint is that it can be really slow. Now, testing on testing on devices every time can be very overwhelming, especially if you have a lot of devices. So sometimes, whenever I look at how my product managers or my QA engineers test the site, it could be very painful to watch because they will actually test one by one on iPhone, and then they'll test another time, repeat the same thing on Android, and then test it again on desktop. It's just very repetitive. There's a, a tool that I would like to introduce to you guys. It's called GhostLab. GhostLab actually allows you to simultaneously test on multiple devices. And you can actually just access your site on one device, and whatever actions that you do on that particular device, will get repeated on all of these other devices that you synced through GhostLab. And it just really makes testing manually much more enjoyable. And the thing about responsive web that I think you need to do as well is, in terms of testing, it's important to start researching the kinds of tools that will make testing easier. And this is when we can start thinking about visual regression tools. Visual regression tools can actually allow you to compare two different screenshots and actually find the difference between those two screenshots. This allows you to kind of test your CSS a little bit better. The thing about CSS is 
Breaking it is very easy, but testing it is very, very hard. And so I come across this visual reg regression tool called Wraith. Wraith is actually developed by the amazing folks at BBC. What it does is that you can actually take two different screenshots, for example, a screenshot of your local environment and compare it to a screenshot of your production environment, and it will spit out a difference between those two screenshots so that you can pinpoint the error. And what I like the most about Wraith is that it actually creates a gallery that lists all of your screenshots, and it categorizes it based on the screen size. And this is an example of a section. So as you can see, we have one screenshot that I take from my local environment, and the other one is from my production environment. I will pinpoint the percentage of difference. The third image itself will point out the percentage of difference of these two screenshots. And if the error exceeds a certain number of percentage, in our case, it's 20%, it will spit out an error. This is a cool thing as well, because you can actually control the sensitivity of your test. You can make it less sensitive or more sensitive. For example, we set it up to 20%. Any, any kind of difference that exceeds that will spit out an error. And as you can see, the third screenshot, what it does is that it superimposes two of these images together, and it highlights the difference in blue. In this case, it's just a difference in ads, so it's not a big deal. <clears throat> but the thing about visual regression tool is that it's not perfect. During my short time of using it, I encountered several problems. For example, it doesn't really render lazy loaded items as effectively as I thought it's going to be. And because of that, it generates a lot of false positives where it thought it has an error when it, it's not an error at all. And another thing is it can be very slow depending on how many screenshots that you are taking. So I have several suggestions on how to handle those. The first thing is regarding lazy loaded items and false positive, there's a setting actually this a setting about a timeout that you can increase so that the snapshot, it, the snapshot process is delayed. This will wait for all of your lazy loaded items to be rendered before taking this snapshot. And another thing is if you have lazy loaded images that will only appear if you scroll down, another thing is there's a setting and options under the setting called browser height where you can increase it just to make sure that it scrolls all the way and every image gets rendered as expected. In terms of slow, I'm still working on it, but one of the things that I think we should do is to just to limit testing, just test critical pages. For example, at Viki, one of the most critical pages for us is our video page. This is where we want to, this is a page that we want to test all the time. But perhaps, other non-critical pages, like say your about page or a static landing page, this is something that perhaps you may not care so much about. Perhaps it's not important for you to test. So we're not completely done yet. The responsive web project has only been going on for about more or less three months now, and we still have a lot of work to do. It's still a, a work in progress. And I think that I'm pretty sure I will find more bloopers along the way, and I think maybe this talk should have a sequel. And, but that's what I have for you, and I just want to say thank you for your attention today. Thank you. Um, yeah, how many devices do you pick for your test? And uh, like, you know, is there any good criteria of like which device we should pick? Uh, we actually use uh, data analytics to actually test, to actually pick our devices. We have a list of devices that we are choosing from. But I think the best strategy that we use is actually we have a diverse of device when it comes to our staff members, and we actually tell them to test it on their devices as well. That's how we actually found the Sony Xperia bug, which is pretty random. So there's actually kind of in-house testing. But my suggestion to that is actually go through your data analytics to see what devices is popular amongst your user and actually focus on that. 